Thank you so much, Sydney. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to do three quick presentations, each covering different areas of investment crowdfunding. Two of them will be focused on the U.S. markets and then one of them on the Canadian markets. We're then going to break for a panel and do an open Q&A. Uh, so my presentation, I'm going to talk about the U.S. crowd investing industry. About myself, um, I've been researching the global crowd investing markets for about the last two years and really trying to understand what's happening in different geographies, how marketplaces are, are structured, what's scaling, what's not, and then what can we expect in the U.S.? And that's the crowdcafe.com. So first, rewards versus investment very quickly. Why does it matter so much? Rewards-based crowdfunding doesn't work for business. There are exceptions. You see the exceptions where you'll see a $10 million raise, et cetera, but 95% of campaigns on Kickstarter raise less than $5,000. The reason is is because if you're a business, no one's going to give you a $10,000 check because they don't want dinner for free for two years. If you look at the median fundraise on equity crowdfunding platforms, this is in the UK, you're looking around $160,000. And actually, that's now about $175,000. On CircleUp, which is a platform here in the US for accredited investors, their median fundraise is $775,000. They've done more than, they've done two, two million plus dollar raises. That's real business capital. Just one example, this is Cedars, another UK-based equity crowdfunding platform. This is a company that raised $300,000 from 157 investors. And let me be very clear, our regulations will not allow for this. It's really unfortunate because this is, it's really a beautiful thing. So if you look at their cap table, and this is kind of hard to see, but in this raise, you have very large investors, 30,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, you also have very small investors out of those 157, 10 pounds, 10 pounds, 10 pounds. If you look at all of these successful raises, they all share the same common trend where you need those large investors. You're not going to raise half a million dollars, $250,000 from 10 pound investments. So you need that investment motivation. So Title II versus Title III crowdfunding. Title II broadly is accredited crowdfunding. Title III is crowdfunding for anyone. Personally, I'm a bit more bearish on Title III. Um, but we're going to focus on what's tangible today, and that is Title II that's happening. You know, and Chris is going to talk a little bit more about other regulations that could potentially become vehicles for crowd investment. Title IV, which is Reg A+, plus, as some refer to as crowdfunding plus. So Sam Guzik has written a lot about that. Highly recommend. There's still uncertainty around you know, the viability of that structure, but I'm excited. Then, of course, interstate crowdfunding. So Chris is going to talk about that. Now there's 12 states that are basically saying, I'm sick and tired of waiting for these federal regulators. We need capital in our communities. We're going to do it ourselves. So Title II accredited crowd investing. Um, what's happening today? So effectively, September 23, 2013 was when companies were for the first time allowed to generally advertise their offerings. What does this general solicitation look like? How have we seen it unfold in the last five months? This is a demo day, an accelerator in Cleveland that the day that went live, they live broadcast their demo day. They could have never done that. So now you're telling startups in Cleveland, Ohio, that their angel investors don't just have to be within 60 miles. We've seen a number of those. We've seen promoted tweets. So this is actually not a fundraise, but I've seen promoted tweets. I couldn't find it, but I have seen these. So you're seeing promoted tweets where people are saying, hey, I'm raising on AngelList or I'm raising here. Previously, that wasn't allowed. You're seeing billboards. Crowd Franchise is a company in Chicago that's building a crowdfunding platform for franchises. They're also running their own franchises, and the founder bought a $30,000 billboard. When you drive him to Chicago, you see his raise. So we're seeing this activity. That said, we're not seeing that much of it. And that's typically the first question is like, why aren't we seeing TV ads or newspaper ads? And why isn't there more of it? 506C offerings are happening. By and large, they're happening quietly. And actually, if you look at, I believe now, and Chris will get into these numbers, there's been over $5 billion raised of 5060 offerings. The vast majority of those are financial issuers. They're funds. They're real estate funds. They're hedge funds. They're not non-financial issuers. And typically, the way they're advertising isn't taking out billboards. They're advertising quietly through their existing email list. So here you have a real estate fund who, for the first time, can say, hey, you can forward this memorandum. And so they're checking that 506C box. Another reason we're not seeing as much advertisement, if you talk to the platforms, many of them are seeing 20% or less of their issuers use general advertising. And it's because when they go to their council, their council basically says, I'm not so sure about it. You know, we don't really understand it. We think you just should do a traditional non-advertised raise. My personal belief is that will become more of a non-issue in time. 
Um, you know, people become more familiar with 506C, more attorneys will be get, get smart on it. And for platforms, really, they will probably be promoting it more because for a platform, for instance, you know, Circle Up, they have a widget that their issuers that generally advertise, they can put the widget on their site. So you go to their site and you see fundraising on Circle Up, which is great for Circle Up because it builds brand equity. So for platforms, general solicitation obviously works quite well. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, an inflection point in the next 12 months, um, but we're not quite there yet. So marketplace structures and considerations. First, market segmentation. How the heck do you make sense of all these different platforms? There's a number of different ways you can slice and dice it. You know, in my mind, there's three big, big buckets, right? There's startups. Those are people going after sort of Silicon Valley-esque, high growth, high risk startups. You know, just a selected sample, there's many, many more. You have AngelList, MicroVenture, SeedInvest, CrowdFunder. You have others going after small businesses. See, there's traditional non-high growth small businesses. Many of these platforms are debt um, or bolster is royalty based. I'm very bullish on revenue sharing structures because you sidestep the complexities of equity where you don't have to sit down and value a restaurant, a single location restaurant, which is really tough. Then you have verticalized, which are going after very specific verticals. Circle up consumer <laughs> products, fund rise real estate. You have 15 real estate platforms. f is focusing on farmland. We're seeing hyper niche asset classes, and we're going to continue to see that, slated as films. That's one way to sort of slice it, but there's many other ways you can slice the market. Sector focus, you have generalists, so AngelList is a generalist, any industry can list, or circle up as a specialist. You have stage focus. Some platforms are, okay, we're going to work with all industries, but only early stage. Right now, we're only seeing early stage activity. We're seeing more and more emerging growth activity. Um, you know, I know Chris with Offerboard, they've looked at doing larger raises. There are platforms out there that are looking at how do we do a $5 million transaction online? How do we do a $10 million transaction online? I will tell you it's not going to be entirely online, but we're going to see a lot of innovation around blended online to offline structures. Um, so we've seen some of the platforms that have done $2 million plus raises, they'll have offline events, but they'll do it selectively based on where investor interest is. Because if you're going to write a million dollar check, you're still going to have to do due diligence offline. You want to meet the management team. Um, but there's a couple platforms, you know, AceNet, um, or I'm sorry, Ace Portal is backed by NYSE. They are not transactional today, but they're looking at how do we do these larger deals. And many others are looking at that as well. And then by affinity. So some platforms are focused on race, geography, sex, interests, and ideals. Um, I believe uh, there's a platform portfolio which is focused on women entrepreneurs. And that makes so much sense. You know, here you have this incredibly passionate affinity group, and you can create these networks of investors around a specific cause. You know, another is Mosaic around alternative energy. So you can slice the market in different ways, and of course you combine it. So you can say there's specialists that are only focusing on seed and early stage, or there's specialists that are focusing on later, later stage and emerging growth. Curated versus non-curated. Some platforms are heavily curated. They're only accepting 2%, 3%, 5% of applications. Others um, are non-curated. So here's sort of the spectrum with two examples. So Funders Club accepts fewer than 5%. You know, Seed Invest is another curated. Whereas EquityNet accepts 100%, as does AngelList. Anybody can list. It's not better or worse. And actually, investors will be looking for different things. Obviously, if you go in Funders Club, you get fewer deals pre-curated, but you're not going to have the type of selection that you'd have on EquityNet. And there could be an argument to be made that if you look at traditional value investing, value is, you know, value can be found where others aren't looking. So in equity net, there could be a lot of hidden gems that aren't, aren't ever going to be on Funders Club. And so there are different structures. I will say that curation almost always drives business models. If a platform is heavily curated, it, it has to participate on the upside because it puts in so much time and so much effort and so much cost into finding strong issuers that they're going to have to participate, whether that's through uh, carried interest or warrants or other ways. So Funders Club, their model is carry only 20%. Uh, Micro Ventures is blended, so they have 10% success fee, 10% carry. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, and so Funders Club, for instance, they have no cash coming in. So they have to, that's why they raise a huge round. They have to cover OpEx because until they hit a liquidity event, they have no money coming in. But that's their model. Micro Ventures is saying, okay, what if we can cover our OpEx through the transaction fee, but then still have the upside. And then equity net is SaaS. So listing platforms um, are typically SaaS. So um, they pay a monthly fee. Other SaaS platforms, Seedinvest has a SaaS product, as does CrowdFunder. Anybody can list, you pay a monthly fee. 
And it's not to say that it's just you know, a bunch of noise, because what they're trying to do is how do we automate curation in a way that we're not involved. So EquityNet has tools for uh, applying proprietary metrics to businesses, as does CrowdFunder, as do other platforms. So big question, are investors a commodity? You know, so when you look at these marketplaces, if you look at the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, it started out as peer-to-peer. But the second that you prove an asset class is one, attractive from a risk reward standpoint, and two, scalable, institutional capital comes in. And it comes in with such size and ferociousness that why even deal with individuals? If I'm a platform and I have $100 million in supply and I can fill that with 10 investors, why would I even worry about 10,000 individuals? That's on the debt side, in my opinion. So I think some marketplaces, investors will become a commodity. And if that happens, it'll become more institutional players. However, in other marketplaces, take equity, for instance, there is real enterprise value built in investor communities. So they do not want to give that up, nor probably can they, because it can't, you can't just automate that process, where in debt, it's almost entirely disintermediated. So there's a platform in the UK, it's a debt platform called Funding Circle. It's debt-based, you invest in small businesses. And they did a study of investors, and it showed that 70% of them didn't look at a business. They're auto-investing. It's entirely disintermediated. So if it's that type of marketplace, institution's gonna take that over. Whereas if it's still an intermediated marketplace where you're investing in equity, you have to deal with valuation, you get to know the business, that is where enterprise value can be built with investors. And you'll see platforms that say, you know, our value isn't just deal flow, it's that we have 50,000 accredited investors who we have trusted relationships with. It becomes an asset management business. So different marketplace, the answer to that question is different. It's a really important question um, that we'll see unfold. Direct investment versus fund investment. So Funders Club is a case study. They started out direct investment, where you invest directly in curated companies by them. What they've now shifted to is fund investment because they recognize that investors want a low cost way to diversify into the market. And for Funders Club, it's great because whereas their direct investments, so when you invest directly in a company, their average fundraise size has been around $100,000. Right? So, you know, they're putting in a lot of work and they're only raising $100,000. Their funds, their average fundraise size has been $750,000. And so for them, it allows them to raise more capital. Now, you can't do that right off the bat. It can be challenging, but they built their reputation and now they're saying, okay, we want to do managed funds. And they have two types. They have thematic funds and then they have accelerator funds. Thematic funds are saying, we'll raise a million dollars for Bitcoin and payments or $500,000. We'll manage the funds. The fee structure is different, and then we'll go invest in these companies. Um, it's a new type of venture capital model. The cost structure is much different, where they're not taking 220, they may be taking, you know, 110. Market optimizers versus market makers. So Funders Club and Seed Invest and AngelList and Early Shares, many of them are market optimizers. So by that, they're looking at existing capital markets and they're adding efficiencies. There's already tons of capital for startups. Now, it's a very inefficient process. So you add efficiencies to it. So you can say, let's take the cost of capital down from 10% to 5%, and let's take fundraising down from three months to one month. That's the market optimizer. And we'll see you know, enormous opportunity there. We're also going to see market makers. That's bringing capital that's where it's never existed before. Circle up, you could argue, is a market maker, because it's deal flow. You have these companies that were not served previously. Now they're being served. You're also seeing market makers in debt marketplaces, for example, Funding Circle, back to them, debt marketplace in the UK. They pulled all of their small businesses. And what they found is that 30% of them, 70% of them said they probably could have got capital elsewhere, right? That's a market optimizer. So they're using Funding Circle because it's quicker, it's lower cost, that's market optimizer. They found that 30% of their businesses, though, could not have got capital elsewhere. That's a new market that they're making. And that's enormous implications for bringing creating new capital, creating new jobs that's being entirely underserved. It's not just adding efficiencies. And we're going to see both. The value of a distributed cap table, both pre and post funding. So how do you define the value of having a thousand investors? You know, that's a key part of this in, in just saying why does an institution just come in and, and buy all the equity platforms and just do the deals themselves? Because for the issuers, if I have a thousand investors or 200 investors or even 50 qualified investors and after I close my round, and I know exactly where they've worked, who they've worked for, because most of the platforms log in or have social login with LinkedIn. And I have a question and I can reach out to them. That's a huge value add. So we're seeing platforms are gonna double down on this 
and adding value to the distributed cap table with pre and post funding. I would say the biggest unfair advantage of all um, in this space is access to capital. So if you look at e-commerce in the early 90s, you look at who survived, Amazon, others, they had insane access to capital. Because when you're building a new marketplace, it's not profitable. You know, these platforms are all going out to investors. They're not just acquiring them. They're acquiring them, they're educating them, they're re-educating them, re-educating them, then converting them. It's really expensive. And so having access to capital, really insane access to capital, creates huge unfair advantages. Um, because they'll be able to run that business model until the market hits an inflection point. What's next? Um, from 2000 to 2010, the cost of building a startup declined by a factor of 10x. Fundraising is next. There is no reason why in 10 years from now, I go to a platform and everything is cent centralized. Legal, accounting, raising capital becomes an entirely feasible process for everyone. And it equalizes opportunity. And I'm excited for that because there's a lot of people out there that could be business owners that trying to raise capital is, is, is so challenging. And there's so many hurdles there that we can just bring that all in and create one centralized process. You know, if you look at informational networks, they've been liberated by the internet. Twitter is a perfect example. You look at the Middle East. All the money in the world could not stop Tunisians and Egyptians and Libyans from rising up because they had informational networks. Today, our capital markets are controlled top down. They are not liberated. Why can't we build Twitter of capital markets that allow anyone to facilitate capital formation anytime? And that's what I'm excited about. So with that, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email, and uh, we're going to break into our next presentation with Chris Tyrell, who's going to jump into interest rate crowdfunding.